Previously on object-oriented programming, we took a look at static methods and attributes. We learned how they work, we learned how to write them. You actually know everything about basic OOP at this point. In fact, you already did even before you learned about the static stuff, but that stuff was important. What we can now do is we can start to scale things up. We're no longer happy with having just one class. Instead, we want to build more classes that do more things. Let's take a look at that. Hello and welcome back to Object-Oriented Programming. Today, we're going to look at writing more classes and how we can associate different classes together. Now, here's the view. Going back to our example of the ball, what if we wanted to go one step further? We wanted to have some distinction between the different kinds of balls that are out there. Let's say we wanted to talk about a golf ball and a bowling ball. Of course, the easiest way to do that would be to build a brand new class, right? Of course, a golf ball, you know, being like a ball, it has size and color. Uh, we may want to change up some of its properties. We may want to be able to say, uh, we can swing at a golf ball, something you couldn't do to a ball. So no problem. With your existing understanding of OOP, you can build a golf ball class. But we've committed one of the biggest sins in programming here, and that is code duplication. Everything that characterizes a ball will live inside the golf ball as well. So why do we bother re-implementing those things? What if somewhere down the line, our understanding of a ball changes? You now have two different places you need to update before everything is going to work fine. So code duplication is bad, and there are many other reasons why as well, but I won't go into those. So is there any way in which we can express to our you know, programming language that a golf ball is like a ball? but with some differences. As it turns out, we can. And even if your programming language doesn't give you that capability, there are still ways to do it. The two methods are called inheritance and composition. Let's start off with inheritance, which I believe is, uh, well, the more appropriate one for this example. Essentially, when you're writing inheritance, what you're saying is a golf ball inherits from a ball. It inherits all the properties, that is all the attributes and all the methods. Since it has all of those things, of course, it's going to behave the same way. And on top of that, we can make whatever changes we like. Let's take a look at what that looks like in Java. Before we get into doing any inheritance, let's make one change first, which I will explain soon. Instead of saying private here, I'm going to go ahead and change this to protect it. And I'm going to repeat that for basically everything that has been marked private here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do that without explaining what that is. Not to worry, we will get back here and we will, you know, eventually explain this. All right. So what I'm going to do is uh, because I'm using Notepad++, I can just collapse the class like this. This is just out of convenience. All right. It's just to make things a little bit neater for us. Let's now go ahead and build our golf ball class. So. The class is called golf ball. But in order to say that inheritance should happen here, we'll have to use a keyword. For the case of Java, it is extends. The class it extends is the ball class. Let's now go ahead and try and build our golf ball. We're not going to do anything other than give it a constructor. Let's start by building a very simple golf ball. All right, we're not going to go into you know writing any of the details yet just the constructor so we can actually construct the ball. Uh, so let's say a golf ball has a fixed size, but the color can be different. So all we ask for is a color, like so. At the end of the day, our golf ball is dependent on the ball, right? It is a ball. So all the information that is required to construct a ball needs to be given here somehow. And in fact, we do it by calling the ball constructor. In the case of Java, there is a special keyword called super. This refers to the super class or the parent class constructor. Now, since we're calling the constructor, I'm going to go ahead and expand it here again. The values we supply are like this, right? It's the exact same two values. So, all right, coming back here, we got to give it a size first. Uh, let's say the standard size for golf balls is two and the color is specified by the user. What we have now is a golf ball, a golf ball based on the ball. Let's see whether we can get it to do some interesting things. Now, I'm going to go ahead and commence all this stuff out. 
and let's go ahead and write some new lines that make use of the golf ball. Let's say golf ball GB is new golf ball. And here's the thing. Remember, we're now calling this constructor, not the ball constructor. So all we specify is the color. Let's say white. Now, I haven't actually taught the golf ball to do anything just yet. But if we try and say gb.kick and then gb.display, let's see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to my command line here, compile the program, run it. And hey, guess what? The golf ball behaves like a ball. Not only is the size and color correctly encoded, the act of kicking the ball creates the same kind of behavior exactly as we expect. Kicking it moves the position forward by 3. When we make a statement like this saying a golf ball is a ball, that means all the behavior as defined in the ball class comes in, is part of the golf ball class now. That's the power of inheritance. That is why you no longer need to duplicate code to do the same thing. Of course, it's no fun if our golf ball behaves exactly the same way as a ball does. So let's see how we can now change things up. Let's start by doing what is known as overriding. What this means is I want to write a function that overrides a function from the parent class. Let's try and overwrite kick. Let's say when you kick a golf ball, it's going to go much further than, you know, your standard ball. So what I'm doing here is I'm essentially redefining the kick function like so. Alright, so let me collapse the ball class again. And we're going to go ahead and rewrite our kick function. All we do is we take the position and we increase it by say 7 instead. Now, let's try this out again and see what happens. There you go. Once I run kick, right, the ball position goes forward by 7. Of course, do note that this definition is only the golf ball version of kick, alright? So if I were to go back here and you know, create a ball, try and kick the ball. Remember, this is a normal ball, all right? Not a golf ball. What's going to happen is the normal ball, when it is kicked, it still only goes forward by three. The golf ball does go forward by seven. So the same action of kicking now has a different behavior depending on whether we're talking about a ball or a golf ball. This is how we can say a golf ball is like a ball, but but what's different about it? And this is one example of what's different. On top of overriding, we can also add new functions. For example, as mentioned, we could try and swing at a golf ball, right? And perhaps what that does is that makes the position go up by 100. So now, instead of kicking the golf ball, let's go ahead and do something more efficient, which is swinging at it. And if we were to compile it, we will see that yes indeed, the position has updated to 100. So swing is a new function that I've introduced only to be used with golf balls, right? If I try to swing on a normal ball, that's not going to work. See, the error I get here is a compilation error. Java cannot find swing when we're talking about balls. So before we end things off, there is of course one thing that I owe you an explanation to and that will be the protected keyword. Instead of really going too deep into the explanation, let's just see what happens if we don't say that. I'm going to set the position back to private, right? I'm going to leave the others as it is. That doesn't matter as much. And I'm just going to compile the code, which is otherwise exactly the same. And let's see what happens. So head over here, Javac, and look, now I am no longer allowed access to the position variable. I can't touch it anymore because it's private. So here's something interesting. We already knew the difference between private and public earlier on. But as it turns out, there is sort of a middle ground between the two called protected. Protected, as it turns out, is used in a context of inheritance. And what it does is it allows a child class to access the value, but not anything else. You could also think of protected to be like, you know, public to all inherited classes but private to the outside world, whatever makes more sense to you. But the main point is, if we want to actually modify a variable in a child class, well, the original variable needs to be either protected or public. Private isn't going to cut it because the subclass, the child class, isn't going to be able to see it. 
So once we fix that, once we change that back to protect it, you will see that the program compiles and runs just fine. To summarize, an inherited class or a child class will look and behave like its parent class with whatever changes that you implement. So now that we've seen inheritance in action, let's try and better understand the broad intent behind how it's supposed to work. Of course, we've already seen the example of a ball class in which other classes like a golf ball and a bowling ball can inherit from. But what actually is this pattern? As it turns out, this is generally how inheritance is used. First, you build a general class. This gives you a very broad idea that can be adapted further into specific classes. That's the whole point. Inheritance is taking something general and building a specific instance out of it. To show you an even more real-world example, consider the example of a phone service provider. In general, you have your customer. This of course refers to anyone who comes and buys a service, and you'll record general things about them, right? Let's say their name, how much they've spent. This will be common across every customer record. But a lot of different services are provided, and we may want to handle these situations differently. For this, we'll have a separate prepaid and postpaid customer. For example, for a prepaid customer, you'll want to keep track of how much money they have in their account at the moment. This notion is not applicable to a general customer, that's why it belongs here. Whereas for a postpaid customer, we'll want to keep track of what plans they have purchased, as well as which day their billing cycle actually starts. Again, these are things that don't make any sense when we're talking about prepaid customers, so we've separated them out. Of course, this whole thought process goes further. Inheritance isn't just one level like this, we can always take it another step. For example, postpaid customers can fall into several different categories. The information being recorded and the actions that can be performed on that information is again different, even though they're all different types of postpaid customers. You can hopefully imagine how little needs to be changed to implement these classes thanks to the fact that, well, with inheritance, whatever is relevant has already been put in along the way. So this is where inheritance really comes in handy. That's all there is for this episode of Object-Oriented Programming. I hope we've gained some insight today, but until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with Nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.